Welcome to our Sound for Video session, everybody. Today is the 13th of February. Apologies for the slightly late start here. Um, I think everything's in good shape now, so <laughs> hope everyone's doing well out there. And um, thanks for joining us today. It's really great to have all of you here. Let's go ahead and jump into our agenda and see what we've got going for today. Oh, wait. Somebody says, I see a slate and hear nothing. Here comes an ad. Stream just started. Okay. okay, we're good. We're back on. All right. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for your patience as we get started here today. Let's go to our agenda. <laughs> and uh, in our agenda for today, a couple of things we're going to cover. First up, we are going to cover the Tascam PortaCapture X8. We're going to do just an overview and uh, give you some audio samples so you can see what that's all about. Um, I just unboxed it last night, so <laughs> I have a grand total of about 45 minutes experience with it. What I did find is I put my micro SD card in and it does take micro SD cards for recording and it didn't like the micro SD card that I had so I had to order another one. So I haven't done any recordings with it yet but we will get you some audio samples at least through the um, send the audio out from the Tascam into the A10 Mini. So we'll we'll do it that way. All right um, after that we do have some questions that were submitted ahead of time uh, it mostly, actually all entirely related to the Porta Capture X8, and then we'll go back over to the chat and address any questions over there. So we're going to go ahead and pop on over to our overhead camera, and let's start with a look here at the Tascam Porta Capture X8. All right, you'll see here, um, this is a handheld style recorder. So this is Tascam's next in their lineup. I actually had the original, not the original, but I had the Tascam DR100 Mark II. That was one of my very first field recorders with XLR inputs. This one here has actually four XLR inputs. That one back then had two. Um, so they've got a few more inputs here. This is now basically in line with the Zoom F, or sorry, H6, which also has four inputs, four XLR combination inputs. Does have the stereo microphones up top here. And these are kind of interesting. What they've done in this case is you can actually detach them. You just unscrew that and then they pop right out. You can see there, actually it's pretty hard to see, but that is a TRRS connector, 3.5 millimeter. So we'll go ahead and pop the other one off here. And they, they were in an XY stereo configuration there, but you could also put them into an AB configuration like this. So if you wanted a, a wider stereo image with the exact same microphones, there we go, you could get that as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, in terms of overall build quality, before I run through the rest of the overview here, uh, very much plastic. They're, the only thing that was metal on here that I could tell are was basically the three point, uh, actually, sorry, the quarter inch tap on the back. Um, I was a little disappointed. I guess for $500, I was expecting something a little bit more. This plastic uh, for the body itself seems pretty solid. I'm not too worried about that. On the DR100 Mark II, back when I had that, it had some sort of straps that were screwed on on the side. I actually did drop it at one point, and it cracked the case. It didn't destroy the recorder, but it did crack the case. Um, this seems like it'll hold up a little bit better than that. So that looks a little bit... That looks promising, I should say. <laughs> um, four XLR quarter-inch combination inputs that can be mic or line level. Uh, two on this side. This is... So these are inputs one and two. These are inputs three, four, five, and six. And it does take, as I mentioned before, micro SD cards. It need, they need to be class 10 or higher. And I think that's part of the reason that mine didn't work. I think I had an older card there. So I've got, an, I've got one of those on order. That means we're gonna be limited in what we can do today. I will have a full review of this over on my main channel at some point here in the next few weeks. Um, but for today, we're gonna be kind of tied into um, just sending an analog signal out of the Tascam over into the A10 Mini so you can hear what that sounds like. All right. Um, a few transport and control buttons down here. You have this big wheel here, which we will talk about in a little bit. What that does, it's generally for adjusting some of the settings, and it's got a pretty nice feel to it. It is plastic, and it doesn't look like it's anchored very well. Um, I think it'll be okay if you're careful with it. Some buttons here, of course, we've got our stop and home button, our record button, we've got a marker button and a play and pause button over here for transport. On this side over here, we also have a 3.5 millimeter input 
and a 3.5 millimeter output. This output is switchable between microphone level to send the audio to a camera or line level, which we're gonna do today. Again, you're not hearing any of this right now. We're coming through our, our regular audio chain, which incidentally <laughs> um, is the Earthworks Ethos uh, microphone. That's going into the Rupert Neve Design sh shelfer channel. That's going out into the camera, the Canon C70. And then that's going HDMI into the A10 Mini. So that's what you're hearing right now. And we'll switch over. We'll get a couple of microphones set up on the Tascam here in just a minute and let get a, a, a sample for what that sounds like. There are also a couple of um, different LEDs. You can't see them very well right here. Uh, you can see them just a little notches. This one is a peak indicator. So if you are clipping, that will flash red. And there is the record indicator here. So once you start a recording, that turns red as well. All right, then of course you have this beautiful three, I think it's a three and a half inch screen, uh, touch screen in fact, and um, it works really beautifully. When you turn it on, of course, you're at this launcher page and uh, this allows you to browse the files that you have. I'm just gonna run through the, the menu here. You've got your ASMR, so if you wanna go into ASMR recording mode, and I will say most of these modes here are just kind of basically presets. It's not like if you, it doesn't give you extra functionality necessarily, it just makes it easy to do that particular type of recording. We also have a voice recording, music, manual mode, which is where we'll spend most of our time today. We have a field recorder mode, a podcast mode. We have a tuner, so for the musicians out there that need to get tuned up before they start recording, a metronome to keep time, and you can put the unit into an SD card reader mode. This also can act as an audio interface, so that's a new feature for Tascam. On some of their older devices, they did not have that capability. The Porta Capture X8 does. So in fact, we're actually powering via USB-C right here. I forgot to mention earlier, there is a USB-C input on the side and you can see indicated here. That's how we're powering. We're now switched over to battery. It does take four AA batteries and it can be switched between um, alkaline, nickel metal hydride and lithium so that the battery uh, status indicator will be accurate based on the type of chemistry, battery chemistry you're using. I'm going to go ahead and switch it back over to USB. And let's pop into manual mode. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn Phantom on. Again, you're not hearing this yet. I want to go ahead and do an overview first, and then we'll get you in there. All right, we just got Phantom Power turned on on channel number three, you can see there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to the input menu. So you have three different uh, pages here. You have your home, uh, which gives you your meters for each of them. You have your inputs where you can set up your inputs, set your gain, um, arm and disarm microphones. And um, you can go into the details here. So for example, here's input number three. This is where I have my Earthworks SR314 currently connected right here on channel number three. And you have this menu here. So I've gained up to 35 dB of gain for that microphone. If I were recording stereo, I could I could make it a part of a stereo pair. So turning on stereo link, that would make inputs three and four then become a stereo pair. Right now I have it set to mic. You can, of course, also switch it to line level if you were bringing a line level signal in. Say, for example, uh, getting an audio feed from another mixer or something like that. We have phantom power. And the phantom power is switchable between 48 volts phantom power and i believe 24 if you have a microphone that requires 24 instead you can do that it does have an auto gain mode not something i would probably use all that often so i do not currently have that turned on and i'm going to go ahead and move this microphone that's connected to this input a little bit closer to me here it does have a low cut filter which you can turn on to 40 hertz 80 hertz 120 hertz or 220 hertz currently we have that off it does have a noise gate, um, and we'll sample that in just a minute here as well. So you don't get a lot of control over the noise gate, just low, mid, and high settings, but it is there, and we'll hear how that sounds in just a bit. We do have a limiter and a compressor. Again, you don't get a lot of control over how those are particularly configured, but you can turn them on, um, both to prevent overloads or clipping, and also to kind of manage your dynamics a little bit with the compressor. Do have EQ as well, and again, not, <laughs> not a ton of control, but you can just choose sort of a preset. Oh, there is a manual actually. If you do go to the manual mode, um, you do have the low, low, mid, high, mid, and high controls. So you get to choose the width, the frequency, and how much of a boost or a cut you wanna do. So that's pretty nice. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that EQ off for now. 
We do have a phase invert as well. So if you're recording a variety of different microphones in the same space and you're getting some sort of uh, comb filtering or anything like that, you can invert the phase on one of the microphones and potentially make that a little bit easier to monitor while you're recording. All right, so that's how you set that up. I also have a microphone set up over here for Danny. This is a dy dynamic microphone. And you'll notice here there's an input gain switch here. We can go between low and high. And you can see the gain range changes a little bit. When I pop over to high, Danny's on a dynamic microphone. Specifically, she'll be on the Shure KSM-8 when we do turn that on and get you some samples. But that gives us the ability to increase the gain. And you can use the big wheel here to change that setting. So whatever is currently selected, that's what the big wheel here allows you to do. So you get a maximum of, of plus 57 dB of gain. And I'm going to bump that back down to 49, which we figured out earlier was a pretty good spot for that microphone and her voice. Okay. I think that's good. So we'll pop back out. So that's the input menu. You can also come over to the mixer menu. On the mixer menu, you get faders for each of the inputs. So we can sort of balance out our mix using the faders here, of course. Um, we can also change the overall mix to a mono mix by just pressing that. The, the touch screen is a little bit... Um, I don't know, touchy? <laughs> I don't know what the right term is. It's not, It's it hasn't been as good for me as, say, for example, my phone is, um, but it does generally work pretty well. Um, you can also, of course, you have a master fader here as well. So that's what you've got there. And then on the home screen, um, this is where you get the recording status here, how long you've been recording. Here's the overall, the master meter, if you will. And then we have meters for each of the individual inputs. So... All right, I think we're ready to go ahead and do an audio sample. So let's go ahead and I am going to mute my main microphone and we're gonna go ahead and bring Danny and I on in the Tascam. Okay, we should be in the Tascam. You hearing okay? Yes, Okay. I hear you just fine. All right, so I'm using the um, Earthworks SR314. Danny's on the Shure KSM-8. We're probably a meter to a meter and a half away from each other. And I'm on input three, and Danny's on input five. Input five. Here's input five. How does it sound? It's a little bit plosive-y. Maybe just that could... Yeah. Okay. Good, good there. Right right there. Okay, good. All right, so here's the sample. And again, the SR314 is coming into input three, the KSM8 into input number five. So what I want to do is while Danny's talking, I'm going to come back to the input menu, and we're going to pop into her microphone input here. And let's go ahead and have you talk a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and change some of the settings while you're talking. So if you would, wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about um, localities with which you're familiar, where you can find um, trilobites in Utah. Okay. Okay, there you go. So there, uh, Utah is known for some really world-class trilobite localities. How's my positioning, by the way? Good. Is that better? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, out in what's called the West Desert of Utah, there are some really spectacular places where one can find some spectacular fossils and where you, there are some nice publications. So if you are never going out to West Desert of Utah, you can actually uh, look at some really nice photos of some amazing finds of trilobites. And a, a trilobite... Mm -hmm in case you were wondering, is uh, a now extinct animal uh, that it was an ancient arthropod. And arthropods, of course, are animals that include things like insects, spiders, crustaceans, which is like crabs and lobsters and horseshoe crabs. Okay, take a little break there. I've turned the noise gate on and I've turned on the high pass filter. So the high pass or low cut filter is now on 40 hertz and Danny's noise gate's on. So if you just pause for a second. Let me go ahead and turn my noise gate on as well, just so you can hear what that sounds like. Oh, I have a request to do the Sherlock Holmes quote. <laughs> I almost have it memorized, but not quite. The, que I sh the question I should is, have it. I should which have one? It. Which one? We've got the, the probable one. Whatever. Prove that two and two made four? Yeah. Okay. Okay, here we go. From... A Study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It was easier to know it than to explain why I know it. If you were asked to prove that two and two made four, you might find some difficulty, and yet you are quite sure of the fact. 
Actually, I think it's the other one. What's the other one? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's this one. Um, it is an old maxim of mine that when you have excluded the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. That's from The Barrel Coronet, also by Arthur Conan Doyle. Okay. So we've got the noise gates on both of our channels right now. I'm curious what you all think of that. So it's set on the high setting. It's um, it's pretty aggressive. And uh, but that's, uh, that's a way it's sort of a kind of um, very simple auto mix type of thing. What, um, what were you gating? I was too busy talking and reading. Noise the gate. Okay. So when you stop talking, it kind of clamps down and reduces the overall input from your mic. I see. Yeah. So that is the noise gate. I'm going to go ahead and uh, I've turned it off now on Danny's and I'll turn it off on mine. Okay, now that's without the noise gate. All right, Dan, if you want to keep talking, I'm going to turn on your limiter next. Okay, I'll talk more about trilobites because they're just cool. So <laughs> there's a really nice publication uh, put out by the Utah Geological Survey that's, that is, um, has really nice photographs of some of these animals. And they look a little bit like horseshoe crabs, kind of. Uh, but some of them get really... Um, interesting looking with lots of spines sticking out everywhere and it's amazing that uh, people can actually prepare them out of the rock that they're in preserving all those pieces they're not that long most of them i mean some of them get quite big but most of them are just like an inch or two long okay so there's what danny with her compressor on and uh or a few centimeters if you are using metric there we go okay <laughs> I'll go ahead and turn my compressor on as well, just so you can get a sense. So here's with the compressor off, and now I'm going to turn it on. The compressor is now on on my channel as well. And on mine too, Yeah. So, if I'm listening right. Yeah. Can you hear the difference? Yes. Definitely hear the difference. Okay. It's less fuzzy. Less fuzzy? With the compressor on? I think so. Oh, okay. Or, I don't know. Very good. I'd no. have to go back and I'm not, listen to it again. I'm not questioning you. I'm. I'm just curious. Okay. Go ahead and turn the compressors back off. All right, now Danny's going to keep talking, and I'm going to turn her EQ on to voice. Okay, keep talking. There are more. There are actually more places than just the West Desert to find trilobites in Utah. In northern Utah, there are some well-known localities which I have not been to yet, but I hope to visit sometime in the future. Um, and these are these are from pretty deep in geologic time, uh, well, recent geologic time, 500 million years or so ago. Um, so kind of deep in the, in the past. I'm running out of things to say. Okay, keep talking. I'm going to turn your EQ off. Oh, keep talking. This is hard for an introvert. Yeah, I know. I heard that. Sorry. Um, let's see. What else? We are in need of some fresh snow. So if any of you folks have too much snow your way, please send some ours. Very e good. Yeah. Even though I know that it's, it's like defying the laws of physics and rotation of the earth and stuff, but we haven't had much fresh snow to speak of since the new year. So, yeah. Very good. All right. Thank you, Danny, for that. So we can go ahead and pop back out here. Um, by the way, you, you arm and disarm the tracks uh, just by pressing down here. So... Uh, you can see <laughs> that touch screen was a little bit uh, reluctant, I guess I should say. But now Danny's microphone has been disabled, so you're all good there. All right, I'm curious if we go to the chat here. Let's go ahead and pop back out to our main camera and go to the chat and see if we have any questions. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, well, we had that question at the very beginning. Okay, so there's a question at the very beginning. And, and somebody else asked it also. Does your unit also have high frequency noise issues at 192 kilohertz? So uh, let's let's go to the main camera, actually. Okay. So the sample rates, the, the recorder does record sample rates or support sample rates up to 192 kilohertz, both for record, well, just for recording, in fact. As an audio interface, from what I can tell, um, and again, I have the 1.00 firmware. There actually is a 1.03 firmware. Um, I can't do the firmware update until I get that at micro SD card. <laughs> but on this 1.00 firmware, um, 
It does not appear to, to support um, sample rates other than 48 kilohertz or 44.1 kilohertz when you're using it in audio interface mode, just FYI. Um, so once I do get those micro SD cards, Navi, I'll go ahead and test that and see what we've got there. I have heard other reports of um, basically self noise issues when you are recording at 192 kilohertz on the Porta Capture X8. So I think that probably Tascam's aware of that and hopefully there's a way they can address that. But I'll I'll take a look at that in my final review. Yeah. Okay. People were chatting about the previous one. DR100 Mark III has a metal chassis. Oh, interesting. This one doesn't feel the 100 or sorry the Porta Capture X8 does not feel metal. Feels very plastic. Aloha. How would it work in a sound bag? It wouldn't. <laughs> you would have to put it on some sort of harness. Um, it's not really, it's not a, it's not a bag recorder by any means. So you could set it on top of your sound bag so that you have the big screen facing up towards you, but um, otherwise. Bit off topic, but what stand are you using the X8 on? That is a sound devices Pix E stand. I don't know if they still make that, Christopher, um, but I use it for, I do a lot of teaching, of course, so for me, it was a really worthwhile investment. It was about $125. It's solid, solid metal. <laughs> it's a really nice stand. Vincent, thank you so much for the super chat, first of all. Um, very curious about this Porta Capture X8. Working, wondering about durability and sound quality. Should I just get a sound devices or keep what I have? Um, I don't know. So, Vincent, I think you have a DR100 Mark III. Um, I never used that recorder, so I don't know how that compares to this. So far on this one, sounds quite good. Um, it doesn't supply nearly as much gain as a Sound Devices Mix Pre does, for example. Sound Devices Mix Pre supports, sorry, um, supplies at the at the main preamplifier stage, 76 dB of gain, and I think you can actually boost it up even farther with the fader. Um, this, I believe, supports, what was it, 50... Let's go back in here and take a look again. I think if we switch back over to the overhead camera there, Danny. Uh, this supports 57 dB of gain. So not quite as much on this one. So if you are going to be working with some gain-hungry microphones, that's where something like the Mix Pre would come in handy. Um, yeah, it depends on a lot of other things as well. Uh, the Mix Pre has a, a number of things on it. It has a, the Mix Assist plugin it, uh, available. You have to pay additional money for that. Uh, it also has the Noise Assist plugin available, which we covered a couple of weeks ago, um, which is a pretty nice feature as well. It's different than a noise gate. It's actually an active, real-time um, noise reduction algorithm as opposed, as opposed to a noise gate. Noise gates... When you're talking, it's not going to be capturing or reducing any of the noise while you're talking, only in between phrases when you stop talking, um, versus noise assist, which can actually pull that down even while you're talking, which is a kind of an interesting thing as well. So there are a number of differentiators between a mix pre and something like the Tascam here. Um, so I, I can't really say which one to get for necessarily for your use case, but that's kind of the high level difference between the two from my point of view. So good question, Vincent. Is this a production model or a sample prototype for reviewers? I'm glad you asked that. So I was actually offered a prototype or an early copy before they started shipping from Tascam. I said, no, thank you. I've got one on pre-order over at B&H for loan. And this is the copy that came from B&H. So this is a production copy. Yeah, I don't want I don't like doing reviews on pre-copies if we can avoid it. Just too many things can change. So it's a good question, Archie. Vincent, I think this is better for the musician or the conference room than in the field or podcaster. Yeah, that makes sense. It's it's one of those, it's another one just like the Zoom H8. Um, it's, it's meant to be a uh, kind of a jack of all trades kind of recorder. And I think there is definitely a, a place for that and a case, a use, plenty of use cases for that for people that want a device that's really versatile. Um, there is one other thing I wanted to show here, and it's a, it's a challenge that comes along with these types of recorders. Actually, if we go back over to the, uh, overhead camera, I'm going to go ahead and switch back to the Porta Capture. So let me bring this microphone back over here. 
And give me just a second to switch over. Okay. Um, you are not in one second. Okay. You should. Oh. Phantom power is coming up. Sorry about that. Uh, Phantom power is on now. Okay. I'm on the port of capture now with the SR314. Um, let me go ahead and I'm going to mute. I'm going to disable Danny's mic and my mic, and I'm gonna turn on these stereo microphones. And what I wanna demonstrate here is the handling noise. It's one of the challenges with these types of recorders. Here we go. And let me just, uh, we have to gain up on some, so let's gain up. Checking, checking, one, two, three. We're still, I'm not really in the right spot for the microphones, but. Here's an example of the handling noise. Okay, now I'm back on the SR314. So now, I want to be really clear about something here. This is not just a port capture X8 issue. This is an issue with all of the handheld recorders that I've used that have stereo microphones built in or any microphones built in. They just generally don't have any sort of shock mounting between the body itself and the microphones. And so that what that means in practical terms is that I think a lot of people are surprised when they eventually get their first handheld recorder with stereo microphones and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm getting all sorts of handling noise. How do I fix that? Well, um, you're going to probably want to use a stand if you're doing any sort of delicate recording. Um, if you can, you, I mean, you could rig up some sort of uh, shock mounting system and hold it by a handle and with a shock mount between this and the handle. Um, just a lot of different things you have to take into consideration. But, Or what I found too is that when I was getting ambient recordings out in nature, for example, is just having a really firm grip, start the recording, Give it a couple seconds for all the handling noise to settle, and then just keep a really, really strong, firm grip on the the unit. Um, that's one thing you know. That's basically what you have to do as well. So, just something to keep in mind that is, if you are going to be adjusting settings while you're recording, um, these types of these form factor of recorders have that challenge that come along with them. So, just something to keep in mind. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and switch back over. All right, I'm back on the Earthworks Ethos microphone here. Any other questions we have there? We have a bunch of comments. Comments. And let's a few let's see. Let's see what so we got. Let's, let's I like the big touchscreen monitor. Not gonna lie, I'm with you. It's actually really quite nice. I don't know how well it'll hold up outside um, in the bright sunlight, but we'll be taking a look at that in the review as well. EQ is nice too. It is nice to have that option. Now, I will say this. 99.9% .9 sure that all of that processing is done in the digital stage. So maybe I'm wrong. Um, obviously, this is also, I should say, <laughs> the elephant in the room. So what's unique about this recorder versus other handheld recorders of the same form factor from various manufacturers, including Tascam's previous recorders, that this, this does have dual... Um, dual analog stages per each input, or sorry, dual uh, digital, analog to digital converters. So um, it can record to a 32-bit float file format, and it also combines those two converters into one. So you do get a wider dynamic range. However, via the, if, when I was looking at the specs, I was kind of not that impressed. <laughs> it didn't look that impressive. Um, let me go ahead and pop that open here. And let's look at the specifications. Um, ma, 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 ma. Here we go. Pop over to the specifications. Here for, let's see here. Even with the signal to noise ratio, they're specking at 101 dB at 48 kilohertz or 102 dB for the XLR inputs, which, um, I don't know, we're going to do some tests and see how that pans out. So I wasn't, um, I mean, I didn't like blow my socks off when I saw the specs, but you know how specs are. You never know what to make from the specs. So 
Um, anyway, so we'll see how that goes. But in any case, it, it apparently does do the wide dynamic range recording. So you, uh, when you're recording in that mode, the 32-bit float mode, in fact, we can go into the settings here and I can show you. We'll go back over to our overhead. Coming into settings, um, I believe it's under the record settings. Here it is. So we can go to 32-bit float, um, just so you're aware. So when we were, you know, again, that's just going to be on the unit itself via USB. We'll see what happens with the firmware update to the 1.03, but I believe it's only 48 kilohertz via USB. So um, just keep that in mind if you were looking for something that does 32-bit float um, via USB. This is not probably the device for you. Okay. What other comments and questions do we have? Mike says, I know you've only just got this, but any thoughts of this versus the Zoom H8? Um, I will say, so far, I think I like the Tascam better than the Zoom H8. Um, the Zoom H8 was okay. And it does actually, the Zoom H8 does supply more gain. So if you're using very gain-hungry dynamic microphones, it might be a better choice for you. Um, actually, maybe it, actually, maybe it didn't. I need to go back and take a look at that exactly what, how much gain the Zoom H8 supplied, but um, they're pretty similar. I do like I do like the touch interface, although again I have to see how that holds up outdoors. Um, the Porta Capture X8 is a little bit easier to handle. I think it's not such that it's not as quite as bulky as the H8. Um, so it's it, you're right. It's a fair comparison, really. Although I will say that I think the Porta Capture is more expensive at $500 US, basically. So it's a little bit on the pricier side. I have, if I had to choose one, I would probably choose the Taz camera as of right now. But we'll see once I get a little bit more work with it. So thanks for that, Mike. It's a good question. All right, Mark says, curious if it has touchscreen sensitivity controls. I didn't see any in the menus. So... Um, we can take another look here. We'll pop back out home. Let me just make sure that we're not going to lose the audio here. I am on my Earthworks ethos. Okay. So let's pop back out to the launcher. Uh, let's go to our general settings. Maybe other settings. We have a peak mark, auto mark, SD card reader, and Bluetooth. You can, there is an add-on Bluetooth just like the Zoom H8. There's a little slot down uh, down here at the bottom where you can add that. Under system, there is information, um, date and time, file name. So nothing there. Power and display. And nothing really there relating to touch sensitivity. So it doesn't look like it, Mark, but good question. All right. Alan says, why are there RF chokes on the two XLRs? Have never seen that before. Don't know why they're needed. Um, these are cables, uh, RF chokes. So if we go back over to the over overhead, uh, these right here are so ferrite cores or RF chokes as they're sometimes referred to. Alan is asking about these. These are cables that were made for me by Alan Williams of Sound Speeds, and they are a, an extra precaution he puts on the cable. So these are Canary Quadstar cables with um, Neutrik connectors, and he puts those on there as a last, last stage of, of safety. Um, so are they absolutely necessary? No. Um, but he, he kind of goes all in, you know, Alan, if you've ever <laughs> followed his, uh, his channel, he does go all in. I've never had any issues with these picking up any sort of interference. So it's a fine question, Alan. Archie says, don't experiment with drop durability and water resistance tests on this episode. You can, <laughs> thank you for the super chat and you, I promise you, I won't, I have to return this. This is not my unit. It's uh, on loan from B&H. So It'll be going back to them, and I'm not going to, if I were to drop it in water or drop it on the floor, I'm sure that I would get the $500 bill. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> All right, Peter. We have a neighbor with a 16-foot-tall snowman. 
18 foot. Oh, yeah. Wow, even bigger than I thought. We may be able to find some spare, spare snow for you. That'd be lovely if you could send it our way. Thank you, Peter. Uh, here in the West, we're awfully dry. Eric says, I have used the H6 on a tripod in the past. It makes it a pain to move around, but it's the best way I've found to use the style of recorder for field recording. I completely agree, Eric. It's, um, yeah. Otherwise, you're going to get that handling noise or you're going to need to start the recording and just keep that really firm grip and not be moving your hands around or adjusting any settings. Even on the stand, it's not, you can't, you can adjust the settings and you're going to get that handling noise even then. So it's one of the challenges here. Vincent, I think this is attractive, but not sure if I'm really getting that much more over my DR100. So I'm not in a hurry to get this or any recorder. You're going to have micro microphonics mm -hmm. from the recorder. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense, Vincent. I definitely hear where you're coming from. Mark, how would you compare this to the Sentrance Portcaster? Um, very different device. So Tascam is all in on digital with the Portacapture X8. The Portcaster is still very much a more analog style approach to things. And I really, I know it's not for everybody, but I really like the Portacaster. I love that it has a really nice um, limiter in it. Um, it's just super simple to use from a, you know, if you're into that, that kind of just knobs and dials and no menus whatsoever. So personally, I, I really prefer that uh, for the type of things I do. It's not a field recorder, though, from the standpoint, it doesn't have the built-in stereo microphone. Well, actually, I think they have an add-on for that, don't they? Um, come to think of it. I do like that the Tascam has replaceable, you know, user replaceable batteries. The Portcaster, I believe it has it built in. I always... Never a big fan of that. Um, the Portcaster definitely has a more substantial build to it. It's, it is an all metal body, so it has that going for it. Um, it's a tough call. I guess it really depends on what you're doing. If I were doing mostly um, the type of recording that I'm doing, which is mostly voiceover and things like that, I would probably go with the Portcaster. All right. Mike, which type of recorder I find? With this type of recorder, I find a Rycote suspension kit is more or less essential. Completely agree. Yep. In fact, let's go over to, we have a variety of questions about the Portcaster or, or port capture here from Warren. Can you just recap? Because Navi just came in. Oh, Navi just came in. Let's yeah. get you. I'm a bit late. Does your Tascam also have the 192 kilohertz high frequency noise issue? Navi. Uh, thanks for the question. I don't know the answer to that yet. I will be inspecting that on my final review. I don't, I, I went to go plug in my micro SD card and it is not compatible with this recorder. So that's another thing to keep in mind. If you do go with a rec any recorder, actually, you really should look at the manufacturer's SD card compatibility list. Um, the one I have was not compatible with this, so I have to order it. Once I get it in, I can actually do that test and let you know. And I, I have seen reports of that issue before, so I'm aware of that as well. So in, a, in short, Navi will be back in touch with you with the final word on that. Okay, let's go over to our agenda again, and we'll take a look at these questions. First up from Warren. I think you can plug a 3.5 millimeter mic into the one and two input jacks, but when I tried it, I get nothing. I tried it with a Rode Wireless Go. I do have two 3.5 millimeter XR connectors, and when I go from the Wireless Go, to the three to six XLR combo jacks, it works fine. Not sure if I'm doing something wrong or if it just won't work. Well, Warren, first of all, I don't know which lavalier mics you tried, and I don't know if that's even a supported capability of <laughs> this recorder. I didn't see anything in the documentation or in any of their marketing materials about that, um, but it is a 3.5 millimeter TRRS input. So you need that four pole input, um, which is typically made for things like mobile phones. So I don't know if your microphone supported that, or you may need an adapter to go from TRS to TRRS. So that'll be the first thing you'll want to check there. And I don't know if it supplies phantom, or sorry, plug-in power. I, I assume it does, but I don't know. You'll probably want to actually, to be 100% safe before you go plug in anything in there, you might want to contact Tascam support and make sure that that is a supported thing and how much power these inputs supply. Uh, next question, pre-rec. My assumption is that when it's selected, the X8 is always listening, and when record is depressed, the X8 can actually include the prior six seconds or so to the recording file. Am I correct? That's the idea, Warren, is that it is a pre-record, so if you're a little late hitting the record button, it should capture the several seconds prior to when you press the record button. 
I don't know exactly how much it is. It didn't say in the documentation. Uh, Warren has a whole series of questions here that we're going to run through. Um, most of them are not addressed in the documentation that Tascam put out with this. So I really would implore Tascam to um, beef up that that documentation a little bit. It'd be really helpful for a lot of us. So on to the next question. Time file increment. Um, there is also a setting called time file increment. And let me just show that to you here. And I think it was under... Is it under system? No. No. I'm getting used to the menus. Apologies here. I don't think it's going to be in the I.O. It's not camera. Is it other settings? Peak mark, auto mark, SD card reader, no system no apologies people i don't know i saw it in the menus previously i don't see it right now um, what that setting does from my understanding is it breaks the file up at set intervals if you'd like it to do that so i think you can choose five minutes ten minutes so on and so forth to answer your question here, I don't know. That's a little bit of an odd thing. I don't, I mean, it's it's safer from the standpoint that it's closing the files every once in a while. But if you're recording video, piecing that back together will be a little bit of a, it'll be a job to get that piece back together. So I would not do it for video generally. Um, if you're, if you're going to be doing long form co content with audio and video, I would generally run the recorder uh, into the camera. And, uh, you know, you'll still have potentially clipping events, but it depends on the format of your show. But if you're going to have something where you can go back and do post, and, you know, can have a live show, but then take that down and then put the post version up if you did have clipping, um, I would record on the recorder and send audio to camera. That way you don't have that, that sort of, I mean, it'd be a lot of work to piece it all back together otherwise. So I don't, I don't know why else that setting would be there. Record settings. It's under record settings. Okay, well, we'll just take a look there. Oh, yeah, record settings, that would make sense. Yeah, Here it is, bottom. time file increment. Okay. You can go 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or 60 minutes. So it can it basically will just close the file and start a new one immediately after the, whatever period of time you set here. All right. I wonder if it would take those six seconds and put it. Yeah, I don't know if pre-record, it shouldn't. If pre-record is turned on, it shouldn't also tack on that additional six seconds because you'd have overlap then, and that would be weird. Uh, yeah. That would be an odd one. Anyway, in the I.O. settings menu, there is an MSD code option that I have no information on. Not sure what this is. That is mid-side stereo recording, and what that does is it decodes the mid-side stereo track, which is a stereo track, so that you can listen to it with your headphones. That's what that does. So if you're curious, we don't really have time to go over mid-side stereo recording <laughs> in today's session, but basically what it is is you have a directional microphone, plus you have a figure eight microphone that is turned 90 degrees to the directional microphone, and it is another way to do a stereo recording where, where you can actually control the stereo width in post. And so that's why you need that decode option if you are monitoring in real time. I'd love a little bit of education on the difference between trim versus gain versus volume versus mix level. That's a good question. This is sort of a general uh, mixing thing. So every device uses a slightly different set of terms, but this is what I will say. For example, gain, gain is amplification. It's taking the microphone level signal generally and amplifying that. Uh, that's what gain is. Trim is usually just like a fine control um, adjustment to that in this context. Um, sometimes trim is the same as gain, depending again on the device. But in the Tascam Porta Capture X8, it actually refers to just a fine tuning of that. So if you're thinking about an airplane, um, there are trims for the for the flaps and for the ailerons. Um, this is a similar type thing. It's kind of just a fine adjustment for each of those. Volume has to do with what you're listening to on your headphones. So it's the volume level. And then mix level refers to, if we come back over to the overhead here, 
you'll notice here, let me go ahead and turn, I'm going to go ahead and turn off that mic, that mic, that mic, and that mic. Okay. And in input number three, I'm going to make sure that we have our phantom power turned on. You should not be hearing this right now. Okay, so we've turned phantom power on. I'm going to move this microphone closer to me. So I can talk into it. And you can see levels. Okay, we just put it on the desk. That was what that peaking was. All right, now if I come back out of here and I come over to my mixer, right now I have my fader right there set to zero. What that means is that I'm whatever levels are coming in on that input, input number three, it's going to send all of it at the same level without changing it up or down to the mix. However, if I reduce the fader, this is our mix level, if you will, now what's happening, and you can notice on the on the master fader or master meter there, as I turn this down, I've attenuated what I'm sending from this input, which is peaking somewhere around minus 12, minus 10 by 16 dB. So it's sending 16 dB less of that over to the main mix. So that's what a mix level often refers to, just so that you're aware. There's also, incidentally, um, this output fader here. So you can actually pull down the overall levels. That's basically your master fader. Um, the overall level of what you're sending out of the TASCAM or recording to the TASCAM stereo mix. So that's what a mix level is. So good question on that, Warren. Go ahead and put that microphone back over here, and let's move on to the next question. I love a demo walkthrough of the camera settings features. I tried this once with poor results. The audio file from the X8 was reasonable, but the audio I fed to my GH5 was terrible. Okay, let's go back to our camera settings under general settings. Camera settings. Now, if you have a Panasonic GH5 and not a Panasonic GH5S, the Panasonic GH5 has a microphone input. It does not have a line level input. So the first thing you're going to want to do is change this to camera level instead of mic instead of line level. Okay, and then from there, you're probably going to need to pull this down. In fact, if I highlight that, can I adjust it? Now, see, it's a little funny. In some cases, the wheel is implemented, and in some cases, it's not. I generally find you need to have this somewhere around minus 30 to minus 25. For most cameras with a GH5 in particular has kind of a hot input, so I would change the input level on the GH5 to minus 12, and then I would change the um, settings here, the output settings to camera, and the level to minus 30 dB, and that should get you in a much better spot for what you're trying to do. So that's what the camera settings feature does. There's also this auto tone, so at the start of each recording, you can actually have it send uh, a minus 18 dB one kilohertz tone at the start and the end, or at the, just the start of the recording. So that way, if you are sending audio out of the port of capture to your camera, and you want to be able to sync those up really well in post, that makes it a lot simpler in post. To, to You can just look for the tones in the waveform, and that's exactly where you line it up, and it makes it very easy. So that's what that feature does. So that is the answer to that question, Warren. All right, peak mark. I'm assuming this places some type of mark on the audio file whenever the audio hits a peak level, 0 dB. Am I correct? You are correct. It places a metadata marker in the WAV file whenever there is a uh, clipping event. So that just makes it a little bit easier to find those and repair them in post if you do need to do that. Um, yeah, that's exactly what that does. Of course, the digital audio workstation app that you use to do the editing needs to be metadata aware and be able to recognize markers, but most of the modern ones do. Automark, what's the functionality here? If we go into our other settings, let's pop back over to the overhead camera, there's this automark feature. Um, you can tell it to automatically place markers in your audio file based on reaching a certain level, an audio level, or at a certain time um, of recording time. So for example, if I wanted to place a marker every 60 minutes, I could do that or I could change that to five minutes. Interestingly, you don't get to adjust it other than the settings that they provide you here. So you get the choices of five, 10, 15, 30, or 60 minutes. If I wanted to do it based on level, I could come back in here and set this to level. And whenever it gets, oh, and you also don't get a lot of choice there, but if it hits as minus 6 dB, minus 12 dB, minus 24 dB, or minus 48 dB, it leaves a marker in the file as well. Um, I think podcasters are more likely to use something like this where they want to automatically place markers in their 
um, recordings. I don't know why you'd want to do it by level, but it's interesting that they have that option as well. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off for now. So there's a, a guess, at least at that one. <laughs> In the system menu, what is XRI? So there's an XRI setting that allows you to either turn it on or turn it off. And in my search of the documentation, I couldn't figure out what that was. When I turned it off, I didn't notice any differences. So I think you and I both need to contact TASCAM support and A, ask for better documentation or more thorough documentation, and B, let's find out what this XRRI setting does. So I'll ask them about that. What does initialize do? This is another one. Um, I think it's reset to factory settings from what I could tell. Um, again, I'll have need to ask and just confirm that. It might be that it just changes some of the settings. I will say this, when I go to the TASCAM again, when I pop back out to the launcher, so if I come here, and let's just look at my settings here. I have all the microphones disabled except for input three. When I go to the launcher, and then I come back into manual mode, and it'll ask me if I want to turn Phantom on. We'll go ahead and turn that back on. You can see it's re-enabled everything. It kept the gain settings but it rearmed all of the mics and again it's possible on the 103 firmware it changed that and it actually retains the settings i wish it would retain the settings across sessions like that that would be really helpful so all right next question do you know how the power savings options work those are going to be mostly i think about display brightness is the main thing that those do again in the final review we'll come back and take a closer look at those uh, sometimes I need to find, uh, sometimes it seems I need a tremendous amount of gain to cause the capture levels to fall where I want them, minus 12 to minus 6 dB. As an audio novice, it kind of freaks me out to set the gain so high. I'd love a bit of guidance on this. Um, well, I don't know which microphones you're using, but, uh, <laughs> they're, they're settings for a reason. And I think it's okay to push them to high settings. That's perfectly fine. You can hear when we had Danny talking on her mic, we had her at plus 49 dB. Um, out of 57, so we were pushing that one pretty high. If you're working with something like a Shure SM7B, um, even at plus 57 dB or whatever the max was again, um, it's going to be struggling to supply enough gain. So if you are going to be using dynamic microphones like that, you may want, especially if you're doing it for a live streaming type of thing, you might want a, a FET head or a cloud lifter or something like that to add some additional gain. But it's not a problem, Warren. Don't be afraid to increase the gain. It's not like running the RPMs on an engine close to redline. It's not the same. You're not going to damage anything over time. So go ahead and set it and get, do some testing and, and make sure that you're getting the clean quality that you're looking for. We have an update. We have an update. XRI. XRI is a function that stores the recording ses sessions after each recording. Function... Settings. Function allows the user to identify the recorder used as well as the settings. Okay, very good. Thanks, Vincent. That's super helpful. I appreciate that. From a seasoned Tascam uh, recordist. So <laughs> thanks for that. All right, uh, back to Warren's question. Interestingly, there's a really cool, huge red striped wheel on the X8. What's it for? It seems like I try it all over the place and it seems like it has no purpose. I must be missing something. Yeah. So if we come back over here, uh, Warren, the way you need to do things, let's go to the overhead cam real quick. If I want to adjust the gain setting, I can just tap on it here. So Danny's gain settings at plus 49. Now I can use the wheel to finally adjust that. Um, and honestly, that's the kind of thing that doesn't work very well on a touch screen of this size. So that's where I think it's really helpful. It works in some places, it doesn't work in others. So you'll remember when we went to the menu here and when I wanted to change some of the settings here, like the level, you could not do that with the big wheel. I don't know why. That'd be really cool if they would implement that because it'd be really helpful to be able to change this with um, that setting here. Let's go back to line level. Okay, so that hopefully answers that question for you, Warren. If I'm only using the built-in stereo mics, it doesn't matter what settings are in place for three to six, right? These are only relevant when a mic or line is in use, right? Um, generally, but what I would do as a matter of course, just as a good mixing practice, if we go back to the overhead camera, I would disable any microphone inputs that you're not using. So if you are only recording with the built-in stereo mics, I would disable the others just to be 100% sure. Then at that point, none of the other settings for those particular mic inputs matter. So hopefully that answers your question on that one. K 
Can you cover the functionality of the input settings page? We already did that earlier, so I'm going to go ahead and skip over that at this point. Go back to the start if you missed that earlier. In manual mode, you can see the dB meters to judge the recording on the presets, such as voice. You only see the round monitor, where it pulses green, hopefully, and peaks into the orange or red. Is that just the way it goes? I guess they just want the presets to be simplified. And yeah, that's my read on it as well, Warren, is that those are made... I mean, to a large extent, this, this entire device is made for probably two sets of users. Number one, those that want something that's super simple. So here, for example, if I come into this voice setting, you can see the meter. I don't have a traditional meter. I have this ring meter. I can pop into the settings here and increase the gain. Um, so if I go here, now you can see we're getting a bigger circle. If I really boost it up, I still can't tell. Oh, okay, now it's you can see it changes color when you're starting to get close to the clipping spot. So in any case, that's, uh, yeah, it works differently. These are made to be really simple and to for people that don't, aren't, aren't uh, I guess, familiar with the traditional audio types of tools. So I think that to answer your question, Warren, yeah, that's just the way it is. <laughs> Uh, when I leave manual and then return, it appears the default is to activate all of the mic inputs, even though many may not be in use. Can you confirm? No harm, no foul. If any mic inputs are selected, but none are actually plugged in, I would disable them again, as we mentioned before, just to make sure. You don't want... Sometimes microphone preamps actually can make a bit of noise when there's nothing plugged into them because they don't, they're not operating in their intended fashion. Um, so I would definitely turn them off, disable them. Can you review the mixer functionality in manual mode? So we did a little bit of that earlier. Um, but basically the idea here is that you can adjust the amount of contribution of each microphone input level. So the reason this is really useful is that when you're in the midst of a recording, for example, let's say you're recording a multi-person podcast, if you're finding that one person is getting really loud while most of the others are not getting quite as loud you can use the fader for that particular person to pull their levels down just a touch can you use your finger on these you can use your finger on these um i find it a little easier to use the dial though if you want to do if you want to do a gross change like a really big change you can do that um, but if you want to do a fine-tuned change i find it a little easier with the wheel so fair question and i didn't see there wasn't sort of any double tap to get back to the baseline type of feature. That'd be a really cool feature, Tascam, if you could add that as well. All right, those are all of the questions from Warren. So let's go back to the chat and see if we have anything in the chat. We have a comment from last week. Okay, let's come back out. Comment from last week. By the way, I'm the one who asked about using LAVs with plastic rain covers last stream went about as good as it could, managed to convince them to tie them around the waist in some scenes. Okay, very good, Eric. Glad to hear it worked out okay. <laughs> That's a tough one, but um, it's good to have those conversations up front, so at least nobody's surprised in the end. Okay, this is referring to the, the splitting up the file. Uh, the splitting is handy for audio-only lectures for, say, a pastor talk that we sent out to people that are homebound. Okay, yeah. I think, um, yeah, if it's audio-only, yeah, I think that can work pretty well. Okay, this has two... Break it down. Two pieces. Okay, two-part question coming from Honte. It's a If you choose wrong between the level mic level input in MixPre2, what's the different to adjust the gain in wrong mode than using right mode and adjust the level or use 32-bit. Okay, so line level versus mic level, and then here's a restatement. How do you know a transmitter mic XLR from a mixer is line or mic level? If you don't have time to check the manual or ask live, can you set it on the level or any other secret? Okay, so um, if it's coming from a mixer, it is 99.9% .9 chance that it is line level. So I would just go straight to line level and adjust you know, the trim from there. If it's coming from a consumer grade wireless system, it's almost always microphone level. If it's coming from a professional grade wireless microphone system, it's almost always line level as a start. 
um, but you will have to adjust from there. So that, those are kind of the rules of thumb, I guess, if you will, that I would start with, and then you're just gonna have to be flexible and adjust from there. But if you plug in something that is coming out mic level, say from, from a wireless receiver, and you set it to line level, your meters are gonna be way, on your mixer are gonna be way low. They're gonna be down in the minus 50, 60 range, even when someone's yelling into the microphone. So that's where you would probably first start. Hopefully that makes sense. Matt says, well, the one thing Tascam will do firmware, firmware ups, updates to improve uh, thing, unlike Zoom, which almost ever, never does an update. Um, I don't know the the zoom zoom did something very interesting with the f8 and the f8n when the f8n came out they added all of the firmware features that were in the f8n back to the f8 and in fact to the f4 at the time so they actually did add some new features when it was possible when the hardware would support it so zoom does some of that as well um so they each do a little bit of that. <laughs> I would uh, love to have this recorder for collaboration meetings. It would be so cool. One box, easy to use roadshow. Yeah, I agree. It's pretty, pretty convenient. Was not expecting you to answer any, every one of my questions. Thanks, Curtis. You're no problem. Absolutely. I hope it helps. And there were a few that we didn't answer, of course, because we need to do a little bit more research, but uh, we will get there hopefully in the next few weeks. Thanks so much, Archie, for the super chat. Your opinion of this for podcasters with today's live stream. Hmm. I mean, for me, the ultimate podcast mixer personally, but there's a bias and everyone has a different way of approaching it. So keep that in mind when I say this, I would choose a mix pre. I love the auto mix feature. I love the, the noise assist feature when you need it for a lot, you know, a live stream, multiple person type thing. So I'm assuming you're meaning multiple people for the podcaster, for the podcasting and the live streaming. Um, but that would be the ultimate, my ultimate choice for those. The problem with the, with the mix pre is that it's not the greatest form factor for mixing live. But again, if you're going to use the auto mix feature or the, they actually call it mix assist feature, um, you generally don't have to do a whole lot. You can just grab the fader and move them if you need to, if someone's really loud. Like if, if, I get excited. if Danny gets really excited about trilobites, you might need to pull her, her <laughs> levels back just a touch. Um, so, but yeah, I would, I would choose the mix pre personally. I think they're going to see, we have the advent of these new kind of podcast dedicated mixers. And I think you're going to see some interesting things in that space. We already have, of course, the Rodecaster Pro. We have the uh, Zoom P4 and P8. Um, but I think you're going to see those evolve pretty nicely too. And that may change my opinion. Do the ports also have quarter inch capability? Yes, they do, Linda. So yeah, you can bring a line level signal in or, um, yeah, so they're combination jacks to answer your question with quarter inch capability. The only thing I am not sure, does this do mix minus or does any of them do that? Well, I didn't see any sort of mix minus feature on here. So good question. I am finding though that a lot of the services that people are doing podcasts over nowadays, you don't need mix minus in your recorder necessarily. So a lot of the online uh, services, for example. So even Zoom does a pretty good job of managing that. So, all right. That is everything that we have in the chat for now or everything we have time for. Apologies for the slightly late start there, everybody. Um, we appreciate everyone coming by to learn a little bit more about the Portacaster and other audio related topics. Get out there and make some great sound and we'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.